Welcome into the Coach Rush Probe Show here on 94.1 FM, The River, and the River Sports Network. Adam Stocks along with Lance Bowman. And, of course, the visored one himself, one Rush Probst. As uh, we've got a lot to talk about tonight on uh, week number two, game number two for the Pell City Panthers, getting ready for the first home game of the Rush Probst era. And, uh, of course, the game against Moody. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. As I don't know what kind of – are you giving a sign to steal or what are you doing over there, Coach? I can't, I can't <laughs> give up my information, but it could be good. <laughs> All right, uh, let's start off with the Moody game. Give us just your synopsis of that game, if you will. Well, I, I thought we started out really well. I thought we had a good game plan, and I thought that, um, you know, I, since that we, we call it heavy offense, and it's a goal line, short yardage situation. But I've used it from time to time, you know, to, to set a tempo. And <clears throat> so I felt like going into the game that we needed to work some clock to squeeze them a, a little bit. And, and, uh, and the last time I've really been in that offense was either 03, 2003 or 2004, like that now we had adapted it a little bit in georgia but um but i thought it was a good plan i thought it worked what hurt us though is when uh dejan o'neill went out with a slight concussion he he had shown all week is the guy that could hit the hole understood the crease off the belly the outside veer you know he was a guy that i really felt good about being in the offense even more i I, so we was gonna go down there we got points the first drive we were going to go back to empty with with um, with an empty offense out of 12 personnel, which I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to get not too schematic here, but and then spread it and do some things and get right back into heavy offense. But that way, they, they, they've got a hard time adjusting. They're trying to figure out what we're doing, and they're over, you know, skull dragging a little bit, and then, and then he gets hurt. So we had to get conventional offense quicker than I really wanted to um, uh, and I and I think we played. Here's a strategic mistake we made: is that we played uh, Bedford too early. You know, we played him too early. I mean, we wanted to play him in heavy, yes, but we wanted to not just run him to death in the first half, sort of conserve his his reps to the second half. And I think we just we did, we got out a little bit out of sync, especially when they scored that touchdown. We panicked a little bit, probably, and. Uh, on that deal but overall I thought the plan was good I thought we executed it well and gave us a chance to win yep coach no doubt about it you had to be pleased with with the game plan that you laid out we, we talked to you on Thursday and it seemed to work just perfectly there in the first quarter and you'd also mentioned the aspect of limiting <clears throat> big plays on defense and you only gave up one on the defensive side of the football yeah. how did you feel about your defensive effort thought we played that? really well i thought defensively played extremely well except for the third and 24 i mean you can't give that up and you know i talked to um, bill clark and i was talking on saturday we always talk saturday morning and or saturday mid-morning uh, you know and like we both said you know <laughs> Special team wise, we got to change who's getting special teams up because our safeties coach is our special teams coordinator. So, for the listeners out there, the mat means that players go to the mat in special teams before they go out to perform the special team. What happens is Chase Biles is our special team coordinator, our assistant special teams coordinator is Ty Burke, who's in the box. So what happened is Chase is trying to get special teams ready. We're trying to get punt block, punt return ready, and he ain't coaching his kids. So that third down, you assume that J.J. would not play press man on third and 24. You would assume that Justice Hammonds would not be over, be where he was on the field. He needed to be in a different position, deep as the deepest guy, all that stuff you hear, play blanket cover three, back the crap up, basically, is what you should be screaming. So they didn't get immediate feedback from our staff on the field. We're going to adjust all that stuff this week. Um, that's another first game deal that you just, you know, you work on play the game, play the game, play the game, play the game, situation, 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 but something comes up that you always forget or something that slides through the crack, and that was a, a problem there. So from now on, we're going to follow the ball. We're going to start at the mat, follow the ball, and it's going to be different coaches handling that, not chase. <clears throat> so that will help with that situation, and hopefully we will be in, you know, that situation again. Because if you did that a hundred times, 
you're going to win 99 of them, 98 of them, and, you know, we get off the field on a, on a crucial third down. So, um, you know, again, there's there's things in the game that happens, you know, and that's one of them. That, but I, overall, defensively, I was happy with the way we performed. Uh, you mentioned special teams. The momentum swung over to, uh, to Moody when they scored a touchdown and immediately came right back with L.J. Berry, a 90-yarder down uh, the far sideline from left to right. Yeah, great return. We had changed that return actually on Wednesday. I, I went in and just said, look, Chase, you and Ty, we're not doing this return. <clears throat> we were trying to do wall return. We were trying to do man-on-man blocking. And then, you know, we're just we've not spent an off season doing that. So we just went old timey Asheville 3A 1989 <laughs> wedge, just wedge return. And, um, you know, and I think that's what we did. And now we didn't, we didn't do the confined wedge. We sort of, it was a modified wedge. The thing LJ gives you, um, and I told Bedford this too, and Caleb back there, you got to hit that thing a million miles an hour. You can't tiptoe. You can't look for a seam. You got to go, and you got a hundred miles an hour. It's one cut, and and if it works, it works. And you shoot out like you shot out of a cannon, and he was, and you know he was running twenty one on our catapult system. It was twenty one point eight miles an hour. That's hauling it now. Twenty one point eight in high school football is really fast. So. That, comp- that computes into the four fives uh, for you people that want to know what, what that would compute to us into the four or five range uh, at that time of the game. <clears throat> so it's fast. Uh, a couple other things. When we talked to you in the post game, uh, we talked about uh, the Caleb Gross offensive pass interference. We played that thing about five mm-hmm. times on the replay, and it was just a little bit. And, and uh, you called it uh, the worst call you've seen. And you've been football a long time. You call it the worst call you've ever seen. Talk about that. Well, there's been two calls pass interference been called on me in, in my coaching career. One in 2011 against Grayson that cost us the state championship where the ball was thrown. 20 yards over the ball and they got their feet caught up and no call, no call, no call. Well, the official <clears throat> in that game, Rusty Wins, a friend of mine now, um, <laughs> wrote me a, load, a letter of apology and they suspended that crew or that official for that. And uh, in Georgia, they, they'll suspend officials for, for, for bad calls. And so it costs the state title and uh, no doubt. So come back, I guess, 12 years later, or whatever it is, you know, 12 years later, and lightning strikes again. So here, here, it's not a judgment call. It's a, it's a rule interpretation problem with the official. The problem is, as they're hand barring, and when I said hand barring, he looks like he, he's got three heads. They don't, I guess they don't know what that means. You have the ability to fight and use your hands. So Caleb beats him off the ball right off the bat. So he's in trail technique. So to catch up, the DB, which is pretty well coached out of T.D. Marshall and played at UAB, he grabs his hip, which they, they do. Well, what are you going to do if you're a receiver? You're going to slap his hip away, slap his hand away. So it's a constant battle. Anything from the shoulder down is legal. Anything that's above your shoulder and you move over a hand is illegal. So and the problem with high school officials is that they don't know the rule. So high school coaches go to clinics all the time. We go sit there and we listen to Nick Saban talk about press corner play and hand fighting and arm barring and, and what you got to do as a DB. And so as a, as a receiver coach, you're sitting there and wondering how you counter all that. But officials don't do that in high school a lot. Well, they should, you know, and I think hopefully, you know, that's – but it costs us a touchdown and it shouldn't have been called and it was a bad call and, it, and um, you know, it's uh, – it's unfortunate that it happened that particular night because I believe if we score right there, you know, that's a different ball game. Coach, the, kind of the instant reaction, the feedback when I got home later that night and just wanted to see what folks thought about the effort. I knew that just from my eyes, Pell City had played hard. The energy was terrific. And I was just kind of knocked out that – it was, it was kind of a universal response in terms of, wow, they look good, they played hard. It's been a while when, since we've seen that type of effort. Yet at the same time, we took a four-point loss. So my question to you is, and, and I think I heard your sentiment when, when we talked to you post-game, you were proud of your guys, there's no doubt. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you want to keep pushing them, you want them to improve. So talk to us a little bit about how you balance that out, being proud of your guys but still wanting to keep pushing. Well, you, just, you know, it's just – we've got to eliminate the catastrophic play 
And sometimes when you're steeped in losing, as long as this program has, it seems like that becomes the norm, and we're trying to break the norm. And those catastrophic plays just can't happen. I mean, we, we've got to minimize or cut them out for the most part. The, the, the fumble that Caleb had was just – it was a killer. It's a 14-point swing. If Caleb – Caleb is probably MVP of the game on offense if – he don't fumble the football, you know. So he had a big night. I mean, the the, the the pass interference and his fumble. Take those two things away. He has two touchdowns, rushes for nearly a hundred, uh, and it just showed up as a football player. But the problem was talking to another official on Saturday that works in that association that names will name anonymous. Told me that he said, "Rush, I get what you're saying. I don't, I'm not sure it's a fumble or not, but." There were two other balls that came out with Caleb, that 50-50 balls where they spotted those, and this time the bing bag came out. And like I told Caleb, I said, look, if you're on the road, especially to their sideline, and the problem this time is to our sideline, but, you know, if he had not fumbled them other two times that was called down, probably they wouldn't have, they'd have, they'd have left that bing bag in their pocket. So he'll learn from that. Um, because that one play cost us the game in a lot of ways. So the catastrophic plays are uh, – we've got to eliminate that. We've got to we got to start having plays that go in our favor. And you've got to create your own breaks. You've got to create your own big-time plays and, um, and eliminate the bad – and look, it happened last night in JV and in freshman ball. You know, we had a kid last night that comes off the sideline – and bumps the official on a touchdown to win the game. Calls it back. I think he was still running gassers when I left a few minutes ago. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, those things you can't do. That's just, I mean, those things right there have to be addressed. They have to be punished. And you have to clean it up. And I think that uh, not to be negative about the past, but those things have should have been corrected way long t- time ago. Uh, even down in the younger ages and all the way down into the youth ball, you should know not to bump official. But uh, um, but anyway, that, that happened last night, and we had some other things that was unfortunate in our freshman game. Now, our JV game, us and Moody last night, we tied 6-6, but we should have won the game on just that one play. But anyway, I, I think going forward, I mean, we, we just got to keep fighting and, and keep uh, looking for the good things to happen. Um and keep working. I mean, it's just all about work and, and not reverting back, but keep pushing forward. The Rush Probe Show here on 94.1 FM, The River and The River Sports Network as we broadcast live from City Market Grill and Buffet. And uh, appreciate everybody who's come out tonight as well, school board members and uh, lots of officials from across the city. We appreciate that. And uh, fans coming out here as well. Um, you know, we, we talked about it, I think, last week. We talked about it during the broadcast last Friday. Uh, typically, it's it's uh, the teams playing each other, but what kind of bubbled to the top was was Rush Probst against Jake Gaines, and it was kind of the two coaches going at it. And uh, we were talking before we turned the mics on, and you were you were telling us that Jake was actually a ball boy for you when he was about seven or eight years old, and so uh, you've got you've got some history with he and his family, and and uh, you complimenting him on his coaching ability, and and uh, now that it's all over and done with and everything, looking back on it, talk about your relationship with Coach Gaines and 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 how that all kind of you know last Friday night. I, I think Jake's on the way of being a really good football coach. I think he, he's young and. You know, when I was 29, you know, you know, knew where I was. I was right up here at Asheville High School, and you know, we talked about that. Um, back, you know, Saturday we talked a couple of times. We talked a couple of times Sunday. We talked a couple of times Monday, and then, you know, I got a lot of respect for him. I mean, you know, and the thing, and he's humble. He comes to me, asks questions, and you know, he wants information, and I don't mind giving him to. Him. I mean, it, when you get to my age, you got to give back to the game, and we got to have good young coaches continue doing. To, to prompt this game up because, you know, it's always under attack, you know, from you-know-who. And I think that uh, people like Jake and those guys are in that 29 to 39 range that are young football coaches. They have to learn. And and he's, he's got some things to learn. There's no doubt about it. But he's a good young football coach, and he cares about winning. And he's been, around, he's been exposed as a player, as a coach. He was at Thompson. 
Um, his aunt, his aunt was Jill Gaines, who's an attorney in Bessemer, and uh, she had married one of our school board members, Bill Veach, and uh, you know that used to come to the games, and and uh, when he was like I said, eight or nine, ten, eleven years old, and so he was around. He was around Hoover football and back in them days, and but I got I got nothing but good to say about Jake Gaines. I think he's going to be good. I think he's going to continue to grow and and um, um, got nothing but great things to say about him. And if he needs help or he may not need my help, but I'd be more than willing to help him any time he asks. The Coach Rush Pro Show here on 94.1 FM, The River, and the River Sports Network. It was broadcast live here on this Tuesday, 7 o'clock or so. We uh, go live on our YouTube channel, which is 94.1 FM, The River, and then uh, give you the link on our Facebook page, which also is 94.1 FM, The River. We appreciate uh, all of those that uh, subscribe and follow us here. So quick timeout. When we come back, lots of stuff to talk about, lots of stuff in the media this week. Coach is never one to shy away from anything, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the Leeds Green Wave coming into Pete Rich Stadium for the first home game of the season here as well. Stick around. It's the Rush Probe Show here on 94.1 FM, The River and the River Sports Network. When two hometown girls with a love for t-shirts turn a dream into reality, the result is Small Town Blanks, Pell City's new premier t-shirt shop. With our Small Town Blanks t-shirt brand and the highest quality fabrics, we can outfit our customers with the vibrant colors and endless custom options they desire. We offer traditional vinyl and screen printing along with our super comfy sublimation prints. And we are proud to partner with local schools, organizations, and events to design their one-of-a-kind shirts. Small Town Blanks made with hometown love. Hey Panther Nation, it's April at Merle Norman Cosmetics, and I'm excited to introduce you to our new venture, Blush Boutique. You already know about the amazing skincare and color cosmetics that we offer, but what you may not know is that we also have clothing, handbags, jewelry, and Panther game day t-shirts. Shop local and come visit the new Blush Boutique at Merle Norman. We are located at 1915 Hogswell Avenue in historic downtown Pell City. Since 1903, the name Union State has represented a commitment to reliable service for generations of valued customers. And with over 150 years of combined experience, our staff at Union State Insurance looks forward to serving you and your family for generations to come with superior value and friendly service. Call me, Drew Alexander, at Union State Insurance, 205-884-1670, or on Facebook, Union State Insurance. This is Senator Lance Bell. I want to thank you for the opportunity to represent you in Montgomery. I am so excited about this time of year as we watch our cheerleaders, our football teams, and our band as they perform on the field. And parents, I'm not forgetting about you. That's what's great about Alabama. I'm Senator Lance Bell. Thank you for the privilege to serve you in Montgomery. Jefferson State is the best choice for my education. You can get a jump start on college by completing college credit while still in high school. Or get an associate degree in one of Jeff State's high demand career programs and start earning great pay right away. How about saving thousands in tuition by starting at Jefferson State, then transferring to a four year university? And with online classes and four convenient campuses, I can earn a degree around my schedule. Find your place at Jefferson State. Registration going on now. Welcome back to the Coach Rush Probe Show here on 94.1 FM, The River and the River Sports Network. A great crowd here at City Market Grill and Buffet. Thanks to Kenneth and his great staff, Cindy and everybody taking care of us, uh, all you can eat. And those of you that uh, want to bring your kids, students, 10 bucks. All you can eat buffet on Tuesday nights when we're here, and that includes your drink as well. Lance, make sure you tip, by the way. Lance Bell, that is over there, does a great job on the sidelines for us. I know Norman Wilder won't, so I got to cover for Norman, if you will. <laughs> I love me some Norman Wilder. Uh, Coach, before we uh, get into talking about leads and, and the game, first home game and everything, you know, uh, the officials, um, you know, they – Tough job that they've got. Um, you know, a lot of stuff is, is bang, bang, and, and just, you know, overall, your, your assessment of a, the officials last Friday night. 
Well, you know, I worry about our officials in the state, in both states, to be honest with you. Yeah, they do have a tough job. But overall, I think they did a good job. I think, you know, one call don't define you. And look, never does an official make a call that, you know, a coach will – it'll be 10 to 1. Usually it's 10, maybe 15 to 1 ratio of how many bad calls a coach makes versus what an official makes. So when you look at overall – you know, an official, there may be three or four bad calls in a game where an, a coach is going to make 15, 20 bad calls in a game at least. You know, you're lucky if you're 50-50. So, overall, overall, I think they did a pretty good job. And I think that uh, – uh, but I do worry in our state of Alabama and Georgia that, you know, in Georgia they're splitting where Friday, Saturday night games early on because there's not enough quality officials. So, in some of those marquee ball games, uh, you know, there's a lot of out-of-state games, a lot of cross-sectional games. So they try to put the best officials. So if you can't get all the officials on Friday night, then they move those games to Saturday, especially before region play. You know, and I think that's – we've got to pay officials more. We can't continue to pay officials $110, $115 a game. We just can't do it. I mean, because – the average age of officials in the state of Alabama is 55 or 56 or 57. I think the same in Georgia. Now, in Georgia has raised the pay some because ticket sales in Georgia have gone up more. You know, um, you know they're charging for a regular season game in Georgia, 11, 12, 13, 14 dollars. And playoff revenue is a lot greater too. So, we, you know, but we got to do a better job of taking care of our officials and encouraging people to get into officiating. And that 25 to 35 year old guy that can go make four or five hundred dollars a week, you know, is what it needs to be that target, and it will increase that part. The love of the game, I don't know about that anymore. Now you better you got to pay these guys because look, we require so much of those people to go clinic. And to go do the things they got to do to be a good official, all the coaching stuff they got to do, and or officiating stuff, the camps they have to attend, the testing, and all that. Heck, let's uh, let's let's pay them. Talking with uh, Coach Rush Probst here on the Rush Probst Show on ninety four one FM, the River and the River Sports Network. Adam Stocks along with uh, Lance Bowman as we've got a big game coming up this Friday. You can watch here on the River Sports Network. Uh, we'll talk about that. The Leeds Green Wave coming in. Jerry Hood, an old friend of yours, uh, you're going to go head to head with him. Coach, you're never one to shy away from from anything, from any any headline, any uh, any topic, any subject, or anything like that. So. Um, you know, there, there's been some articles written recently, and and um, there some, been. some 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 editorials that uh, they try to make it as news, and um, you know, just do you hear that? Is it just background noise? Do you use it as motivation? What uh, you know? Give us your thoughts on all this. You know, you try to block it out. Paul Feinbaum texted me today and told me to keep doing what I'm doing, and you know, and I think that it meant a lot coming from him and. Um, Said, give me his best wish. He believed in me, and you know, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I just think, and there's been more to reach out. I mean, people that you, you know and you trust. You know, guys have been in this arena a long time. You know, but um, no, nah, it's just it's part of the it's part of it. You know, it's just, we've become a social media um, giant. You know, and and um, and it just it happens. You know, I think a lot of it goes back to. With me is the you know the two a day stuff and the Netflix stuff and and all that, but but you know but the spin on all that's been positive, and you know and then there'll be some negative spin to it. But what those two programs did for those communities, it changed them, and for the good, and it changed a lot of it, two a days changed a lot of schools throughout the country, of the 77 million people that watched it. You know, there were eight-man football that went to 11-man football. There were teams that didn't have football in Alaska, Montana, Utah, out. I mean, everywhere that created football based on that show. So, you know, you don't see a lot of that. You know, you will see the, the, the people that complained about two-a-days were the people that couldn't beat us, you know, and, and uh, that was the people complaining about two-a-days. But, you know, it is what it is. I mean, you just got to keep doing your job and doing what you do and, and uh, you got to block out the noise. You got to focus on what's important. And what's important is coaching your players, getting your team ready, 
keeping your community knowing that they're you know they got we've got our program heading in the right direction and and you can't worry about the negativity uh the community rallying behind you if, if there's one thing i've really seen is and you see it in the comment section on social media you see the the outsiders trying to bring not only you but the whole community the school system i mean well one goon calling out the the school superintendent the board today i mean it's just you know it's, it's ridiculous some of the things on there but yeah. looking at the positives like you said to see the community rally and tired of the one in uh, one in nines, the two and eights, and and seeing that they're behind you now. What does that mean to you? Means an awful lot, you know. And I think you know we've got great support here. And I, and I made a statement today to some somebody in the media that that uh, that this town is about as well. I, did, I do a podcast in South Georgia uh, every every week, uh, thirty minutes, you know, in South Georgia football. And I think because it's passionate down there too. And I and I made a statement that I think. At Pell City, right now, is 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 as fired up and passionate about the turnaround of this program as any place I've ever been. I, I really believe that. I think that you know um, it's been so long, and I and I've seen it to where and Steph and I've lived it. You know, people here are hungry to win, and and they were other places, but I think this is a little bit different. When we get this place turned around, and we will then you're going to see a different wave of people. That crowd of the night was enormous. It was a playoff atmosphere. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I'm just excited. But, you know, and, and <laughs> the thing that bothers me more than anything about what's going on is just tell the truth. You know, just be truthful for what happened. You know, the headset stuff. I mean, I didn't throw that stuff at my son. I threw it at his feet trying to break up a fight. And so the headset never hit him. It, it went to the ground, and so I couldn't get to him. I mean, I couldn't get to him. He was trying to get on the field, and, in, in, and look, you cannot let players get on the field. So if I stand there and I don't do anything and players get on the field, then you're in trouble. You get suspended. You you lose a right to maybe be in the playoff. So it's it's all bets are off then. So, you know, that's the only thing. I could not get to him, so I, I reached and grabbed my headset and threw it down on the ground in front of him. But it never hit him. So that's the that's the thing. They want to make it like I took it and hit him with it. I didn't hit him with it. And so um, you know, but I mean, you, it's it's a spur of the moment thing. And most of the time, Adam, the people that do that have never been on the sideline. They don't know. And so bless their hearts. You know, you just <laughs> you know you just gotta you just gotta keep doing your job. And because we're taught as coaches to de-escalate, to, to keep it from blowing up because, as you know, it can escalate quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I thought we did a great job. I think, our, I think our coaches and all of us, I know my director of football ops tackled one of our players, and, and, and I know that we had to just get it separated really, really, really quick. And when we did, when it got under control, because they had some kids that left their sideline coming our way. If we hadn't, then all of a sudden, boom, and then it's just all out war then. So uh, I thought we did a great job getting it stopped. And, and I applaud our coaches. I applaud everybody involved in getting it stopped. I know Coach Robertson, our athletic director, was in the middle of it and, and stopping stuff. And, and it, it just, it, boom, boom, it happened, and it was over with fast. So, you know, I think it, it goes back to anything else. You know, you just keep doing what you're doing. We did it right. It was done right and we'll go move on and play the next game. Coach, outside of that one play in a very competitive game, there really weren't any other issues as nah. far as from when the clock started to when it ran out zeros. It was one incident That's on it. a late hit on the sideline. That's right. Coach, you talk about this town being fired up and the response that, that they've had. Moody had a great crowd. It was a great game. It was a competitive game from start to finish. It kind of pr had everything you could ask for in a, in a good football game. So I salute Coach Jake Gaines and the Moody community as well as Pell City. Our sideline reporter, Lance Bell, gave us a temperature of 138 degrees on the field. Nice. Despite that heat, their stands were packed. Pell City's visiting stands was packed out, and I counted three to four deep along the fence. Yeah. Here's your chance to encourage that same group of people to come out to Pete Rich Friday night. No, I think it's got to be that way. I mean, I think Leeds is coming in 0-1. <clears throat> We're 0-1. Both teams could very easily be 1-0. Um, so Jerry and I have gone to war many a times, and 
over the years. Um, I'm good friends with Jerry. I think he's a great coach. I think he's a good guy. Um, you know, we'll we um, you know I can remember some of those battles too. We've been in the semifinals before against each other. You know, and I think that um, um, I look. I know what kind of football team he's got. I know how physical they are. I know they've got some really good players. Here's the other thing. Curtis Coleman, nobody talks about Curtis Coleman. Curtis Coleman's their D-line guy. He does a phenomenal job. Their D-line is really good. Curtis played football, was an all-conference player for Livingston and played with my brother down at Livingston in the late 70s and early 80s. And, man, when he was at Huffman High School, we had some wars at Lawson Field, Legion Field, and at the Met. And I've never, ever been around a team or coached against a team that Curtis had his hands on that wasn't extremely physical. So the game will be physical. Uh, he'll have them ready to play, especially that front. Jerry, it's Jerry's defense with Curtis coaching the front. So uh, I think that's the key. Is The key to the game is just our offensive line versus their D-line. That, that war in the trenches – is going to determine the football game. And, and you know, you got SEC DN, SEC defensive end. you got a, a Troy, uh, maybe not a commitment inside yet, but close. You know, their four guys, their four hands, their four down package can really play. And, and probably there won't be another group we play any better as far as that. Now, once we get past that front line of defense, I think we could be – you know, get some things done. But the key to it is what do we do to neutralize that? Well, Jerry probably knows what I like to do to do that. So he'll be ready for some of that. So there'll be a little counter punch in there with that. But I think we, we've got to figure out how to get them blocked up front or it's going to be in for a long night. Oh, when you go against a quarterback and, and you guys – or excuse me, another coach, you guys have gone head-to-head many times. And, and like you said, you, you probably know what he wants to accomplish. He knows what you want to accomplish. How do you throw some wrinkles in there and, and make it again? Obviously, you know, not giving the game plan away, but but as a head coach, how do you throw some wrinkles in there that that might throw them some curveballs? We just got to be different. I mean, you can't ever just line up and be the same. And you got to you got to change personnel. You got to say you got to change approaches and give it some eye candy. And but the thing with Jerry does that helps him is they they don't they don't get one defensive front. Ninety five percent of the time, they're going to play four down. Now. Whether they play one backer box, two backer box, I think that will be the, the, the sort of the chess match is whether he wants to play 4-1-2 high or 4-2-1 high. He never he never has liked to be the 4-2-1 high guy So uh, because his four downs are good enough to, to box you up. So we're going to have to really counter that to make sure that if we can get him into the 4-2 box and he's one high, then we got some things downfield we can – maybe take advantage of if he stays 4-1 you know we can't have some success running the football a little bit out of 4-1 you're in trouble because they got seven people in perimeter and that's that's hard and and uh especially with a quarterback that's uh you know a little bit in- inexperienced so you know the heavy offense you know we'll have to mix in heavy we'll have to mix in panther we'll have to mix in all the things that we're doing and when i leave this show we'll go home tonight or go back to the office tonight, and we'll critique everything we did in practice today. We'll pull some uh, some footage up and look at some cuts and things of that nature to to figure it out. Because tonight is the final plan. You know, you don't leave out office till whether it's nine o'clock, ten o'clock, or midnight before you put the final stamp on the game plan. It's got to be done tonight. So, um, with that being said, you know, um, I mean, it's it's going to be tough. Um, with them because they're really, really good up front. And we're going to be outmatching some of that. So the other thing that they give you is their quarterback is really good. Uh, he's a heady kid. He runs. Um, the the quarterback coach at Leeds <clears throat> is a former quarterback at Piedmont, Hayes. Um, his brother, Jack Hayes, who just finished at Piedmont, a four-year star. Well, this, this kid was a four-year star. So for eight years, Steve's had – a hey, he's starting at quarterback, and they, they played alike. And it's a lot of quarterback run, a ton of quarterback run. If you watch the 3A state championship game the last two years, you know, there's not a quarterback in the history of this state that's had more yardage than Jack Hayes. He's, he's won in every category. Well, his brother has a lot of that Steve Smith-type Q run stuff brought to leads 
in Jerry's offense, and I think it's helped our offense with that. So this quarterback they've got is pretty good. We'll have to fend him uh, and, and, and bottle him up because he can beat you. He's good enough to beat you now. The Rush Probe Show here on 94.1 FM, The River and the River Sports Network, live every Tuesday here at City Market Grill and Buffet. Thanks to our good friends here. Come on by and have a meal with us and enjoy the show, just like a bunch of people behind the cameras are right now. Uh, one of the cool segments that we're adding this year is uh, Panther Legends, which is really cool. Lance looks back at uh, some, of the, uh, some of the names that are very notorious when it comes to Pell City football, uh, names that roll off the tongue. And, Lance, we got a good one that, uh, that you and I got to watch personally this time around. Yeah, you know, we had a great response with David Gulledge last week. That's going all the way back to the mid-1980s. Great career. Got it, guy that made it to the NFL, but really excited. Coach talked about – that Panther pride, and that's really what this is about, and getting back to some of those teams that – not just the players, but the, the legendary teams that they represented. And we have a great one, a guy named Bam Sanders, and we're going to talk about him next, mm -hmm. Panther Legends on that clip. And kid that led the nation, FBS Nation, in interceptions in 2008. Kevin Bam Sanders was a two-way star for Pell City and as a senior quarterback, he led the Panthers to the most wins in school history. Earning All-State honorable mention from the Birmingham News and Alabama Sports Writers Association for his play as a defensive back. After signing the highly recruited Sanders, UAB head coach Watson Brown had to make a difficult decision as position coaches on both sides of the ball were clamoring for Bam's all-around athletic talents. Ultimately, the defensive coaches won out, and the result was Sanders becoming one of the most prolific cover corners in Blazer football history. Becoming a starter as a freshman, Bam started 40 games over his UAB career, and as a senior, led the nation with seven interceptions. Remarkably, he accomplished this feat while playing with a cast over a broken right wrist. Sanders was also a touchdown scoring punt returner and finished out his time with the green and gold, second all time with 15 interceptions and an all conference USA selection. Kevin Bam Sanders, PCHS class of 2003 Panther legend. Brought to you by Apex Vehicle Services at Pell City Golden Pond. Bobcat dealer for East Central Alabama is Bobcat of Gadsden. And they're a full line Bobcat dealer for construction and agriculture. They specialize in parts, service, sales, and rentals. And right now they have great financing rates. Bobcat of Gadsden, same day delivery on rentals, factory trained service technicians, and they're ready to serve you. Call 256 563 4001. Heard about Jeff State's Fast Track program? Listen up. Employment in as little as six weeks. Yep. In-demand jobs? Definitely. Jobs in industries like IT, medical, industrial, manufacturing, and more. Get an in-demand career in as little as six weeks. Why wait? Get on the Fast Track at Jefferson State. Act now. Visit online or call 205-856-7710 today. Find your place at Jefferson State. Having a teen driver can be worrisome enough. You shouldn't have to worry with how you'll afford the added expense. At Alpha, not only do we offer discounts for teen drivers, but you will have peace of mind knowing your family has protection. Call me, Alpha Agent Brooke Tolleson, at 205-884-3470 to learn more about our discounts for youthful drivers. Back here on the Rush Probe Show on 94.1 FM, The River and the River Sports Network. Appreciate everybody who's come out this evening and enjoyed a nice meal here. Uh, thanks to uh, Kenny and Cindy and the great staff here at City Market Grill and Buffet. Every Tuesday about 7 o'clock we go live on the uh, uh, Facebook and also on the YouTube channel. So we appreciate everybody watching it. And we build it into our uh, pregame show on Friday as it starts at uh, 5.30. Uh, Coach, we talked about uh, leads coming in this Friday and a big game alumni night. We were talking about that off the mic. Uh, what are some of the things that are going to happen Friday night for them? Um, I think line them up or Moose Club lines them up. People that are alumni. I think cheerleaders and former players and former band members and and uh, recognize them before the game and 
you know, it's been so hectic, uh, Adam, that, you know, probably we could have done a little better job with the organization of it, but it's just been so much so fast because when you get hired late and all the things that went down, you know, it just it's, it compiles and you just have to prioritize. But, you know, we'll do the very best we can this year, but down the road each week that you're at a home game, you need to have like an alumni night this time, uh, arms force uh, night, then you need a, a uh, youth night for your youth teams and march them out in their uniforms and let them watch warm-ups and all the things you do once we get all this fixed and then – you know, then you got senior night and you got homecoming. So those are five, you know, but hopefully in the future, you know, we can start playing six home games, you know, and four on the road. I, you know, we, we we got to that at the other two places I coached. And, you know, we've got to buy an opponent or whatever where we have that extra home game. And uh, because you got, you know, your region games, I think there's seven in it. <clears throat> so, you know, that's – I guess that's three on three at home, three on the road, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. But you know, I haven't played a five. And this is the first five-five home and away that I've played probably in Lord of Mercy, probably since '08. Wow. Yeah. So it's been so usually we can tip that scale and start going six-four, and it's just a better sale, you know, uh, for your community and for your town and everything. From the coaching standpoint, assistant coaches, players, what are some of the big differences? as far as going on the road and then staying at home? What are some of the, the advantages for you and the, the staff and the players? Well, it's, you know, it, the difficulties on the road are nothing more than your your pregame and your halftime adjustments and, and, the, and the size facility that you dress in. Or and, no air in or, the visiting locker room. Yeah, yeah that was hot. Yeah. It was very hot in there. And uh, so that part – makes it difficult but really i don't you know my i've had probably just as much success on the road as i have at home um statistically i think we won more ball games on the road in playoffs and maybe any school in georgia during that 10-year period so we 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 like traveling and um uh, uh from that perspective i mean i think we've got it down pretty pat you know on how to travel and what you should do and let me say this there's a 30-minute trip, there's an hour trip, there's an hour-and-a-half trip, two-hour trip, two-and-a-half hour. Each trip, all the way up to the six-hour trip, you have to adapt differently. Um, I tried to. I tried one time to take a six-and-a-half-hour trip and, and treat it like a four-hour trip, and we got beat because of it. It's just different. So you have to know all those little ins and outs, and my wife does a phenomenal job of that, and uh, she's she's been involved with it for a long time and knows how things have got to be done at each little place and how we do that. So, you know, we'll handle you fall a little bit different. <clears throat> I think that's the next away game we got, and the next three are at home, so we don't have to worry about it for three weeks. But and then you fall will be a little lengthy trip, so we'll decide whether we'll leave Friday or Thursday. You know, I think you know two and a half hours starts to get into that deal to where. You, you can't travel the same day. That That's the advantage of why we won so many ball games on the road is we wouldn't travel the day we played. You know, you, you can ask a kid to get on a bus, travel two and three and a half hours on a bus, and get off and, and play at the level in which you – because if you do that, you're not going to play as well. It's, just, it's been scientifically proved over and over and over and over. So, you know, you have to think about that. You know, now you may be good enough to win, but if things are equal – and you're traveling two and a half, three hours on the road um, in a bus, and then all of a sudden you try to play that same day, then your your body's just not going to work as well. It's, it's been proven a million times. Coach, one of the things that any time that we've had the opportunity to spend time with you and talk to you about football, another subject that comes up is nutrition. It's just extremely important to you. Correct me if I'm wrong, no cramps by any Panthers nope. on a 138-degree nope. field temperature night? Nope, none. No. I thought that uh, that we would have a little bit because I thought we'd pushed them so hard, but they didn't. We had Malik Watts was the only one that started to cramp some, and I don't know what our training staff did to knock it out, but he didn't. He didn't. He didn't cramp. So I was talking about on the air. You know, <clears throat> saw today Saban released a deal about hydration coach that they've attained 
and this thing that they can put on their under their tongue or on their tongue that that pill allows their training staff to know uh, what their body's missing what they need and you know and it's become you know brandon shepherd now is sort of our part-time trainer brandon was my trainer all nine years at hoover him and jeff allen are very very close so trust me we'll do the research on that one but uh but you know we're doing it right now i mean like you said from wednesday and we feed them all during the week but from wednesday to game time everything they eat is strategically done by menu and the combination of foods from protein to to the carbohydrates and the things you put in your body from wednesday morning starting in the morning like tonight they had you know fried chicken fingers and french fries that, and it's, it's caloric intake right now so they're not actually not going to play on that but starting in the morning what they eat from wednesday morning till friday at pregame they're going to play on that and so what is different well, here's what's become different. So we feed them breakfast. They come down any time. Like, they come down. They don't eat school lunch. They come to us. Steph feeds them lunch. And the things that we feed them and then the fruit and the, the combination of food from breakfast to lunch. And then when they come back down at the 215 range, they come in and they get other things, that, whether it be fruit, whether it be another sandwich, whether it be whatever they eat. And then they go to practice. Then after practice is their Wednesday night meal, which, again, that meal is an important meal because that meal will benefit you come Friday. Thursday, we repeat it. Same deal. And then when we get to the hotel, what like last week, we ate heavy pasta, uh, uh, spaghetti, pasta, fettuccine, Alfredo, uh, tons of that stuff, and kids ate it very, very well. Three hours later, before they go to bed, they get a sub sandwich with the combination of fruit, a lot of chocolate milk, a lot of uh, so it's a lot of protein, a lot of energy. We know that the complex carbs turn into energy, where regular carbs turn into fat once you go to sleep. So those who have to be really, you have to really think about what you're feeding them then, and then it starts right back. We had a great church breakfast Friday, um, Mount Pisgah was a church we went to they did I mean, i'm telling you they did a great job at mount pisgah uh the food was really good the breakfast was was really really good and so um and let, let me tell you what the kids do if y'all don't think they eat a lot they get up at the hotel and they attack the hotel <laughs> breakfast so they're eating waffles and eggs and all the things at the hotel then they get on a bus, and 30 minutes later, they're at Mount Pisgah, and they pound that breakfast. And so, and then, of course, during the day, it's, you know, the things that we feed them and all the hydration. We've changed waters. You know, now we're drinking the heavy alkaline electrolyte water uh, at practice all through the week. Um, you know, so I, I think it's helped. I think, it's, I think it helped us in, in, in other night, and I think it helped us in recovery. And, and all the things you got to do. So it's a nutrition thing that, you know, the old days of just not doing that, that's why you had so many cramps. I mean, all those years in the 80s, we'd go play the first two games, we'd have 10 or 12 kids to cramp all the way in the 90s. And, you know, but we started changing the way we do things, and it's just advanced, 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 advanced. And I think, you know, I think we got a pretty good handle on how to do it. You mentioned the the hotels, and that uh, that made headlines in itself as well. And again, the community just absolutely rallied behind it. You know, making sure everybody realized that was money that was raised by the the booster, booster club, by the parents, by the kids themselves. Uh, did not come out of any line item out of the city or out of the school system yeah. or anything along those lines. The advantages and and what happens? Explain to people what happens. Why do you go to a hotel? Why why all that? Just the mental focus. Making sure they're hydrated, the mental focus part, uh, uh, and then the food consumption. You know, if they go home, first of all, you don't know they're going to bed. You and I hate to say it like this, but you can't count on the parents to do it that way. You can't d d to do it right. They're not going to take their phones from them. They're not going to make them go to bed when they're supposed to go to bed. So, not and look, we had kids who brought their Chromebooks to study, and so. 
Uh, and there's teams out there now going virtual on game day. So on mm. Friday, we got teams throughout, especially in Atlanta, Georgia, and some South Georgia. I know Coughlin's doing it now. Those kids go to the hotel on Thursday. They're in the hotel the whole day. They do their classwork in the hotel. And you know what? Their grades start to climb because they're concentrating on that. On game day, how much academic work do you think they're getting done on game day? On a, they're, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're just not. It's too much distraction. So in that hotel is you and that one person in that room, and you're sitting there, and you don't have a phone. You don't, you don't have a phone. My, there's my phone. You don't have a phone. That says Nick Saban, by the way, no, y'all. <laughs> but uh, I think that part is is very smart way to do things. And so you control their nutrition. You control the hydration. You control their their control their academics, and then you can control their outside external factors. Those external factors that can affect a player's, you know. Is it a girlfriend, or is it a bunch of group of friends, or is it or somebody that's bothering them that's not allowing them to sleep or eat right, or they're out and they're over here or over there? It's just not. That's just not conducive. And so, um, look, it's people say, well, it's just high school football. Well, it, 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 you're right, it is. But I will say this: most of my players. I'd say in the 90 percentile of players that have played for me that's gone on and played college football, out of that 250, most of those kids come back and say, Coach, I was ready to play college football because we had done this in high school. So that part of it, and we're training that part of it too. And, and so going forward, I think it can only continue to get better um, and we'll continue to improve every facet of our program uh, going forward because it's not just – about playing the game, you have to prepare to play the game in so many different areas and, and things like, you know, we're at the hotel, we've got meetings talking about, you know, blitz protection. You know, we've got a walkthrough for blitz, blitz protection at this particular time. Then we have our run game and going through the run game part at this particular time or a special team meeting. You know, defense have got their deal, offense has got their deal. So there's nothing but meetings, meetings and meetings and film and film and film. And when we get it a little bit better, you know, the coaches can sit. When the players go to sleep, we can sit down as a staff and start going through the week and critiquing what we've seen. You know what? I don't know if I like that or not. It didn't, it didn't do very – so you, say you ran storm right. Storm right's outside zone right. Say you ran storm right out of three formations, okay, ton, ace, and tray. Let's say them three formations. And you look at it, and so you take those clips, and you look, you know what? I didn't like it out of ace. And that may not come to you till Thursday, and you go, what? Check that off. But that's that hotel that you're sitting there, and you're concentrating by yourself. Nobody's bothering you. You're sitting there looking at it. Kids are asleep. It's 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. So you start making your play, play sheet and your call sheet the next night of what you're going to call. A lot of times, as my wife can tell you, it, some of those decisions may not be made till 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, after the kids have been in bed, and all of a sudden you discover that late because you've got the film right there in front of you. So those are things that are important, and that's just pushing that envelope and pushing it to the limit of uh, making sure you get it all done and making sure it's right down and it's done and you tie in every loose end you can. Coach? You got the, the science of nutrition, the, the data, the, the, the play sheets, the call sheets, all the things that you can, can look over and analyze. Yet I've seen it again and again in football as a, as a fan of football at all levels. There's also the type of player that's just different when the lights come on, when it's game time. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's the, the bigger the game, the more likely the kids uh, to show up. Did you have any players that you had seen through camp, through fall camp and meeting them back in the spring that, that you could talk about or maybe that surprised you when the lights came on Friday night? Mm, you know, I have to go back and think about it. I thought, you know, I thought Nikita played okay, um, you know, for his first high school start in an 11-on-11 padded football game. Um, I thought Caleb rose his level. Uh, I think that him just not protecting the football was a – uh, probably because in practice he's gotten away with some things in practice that probably he'll have to correct this week and he's already started to correct. 
You know, Florida's at inviting him to a, a game next week. Um, D.J. Burgess has been up, invited to Georgia as a true freshman. You know, we'll start the recruiting process on these kids and um, start getting their names out to different people and using, you know, Twitter and social media and, and all that stuff to tag their highlights and start promoting these young men as far as, you know, we got to get enough kids at Pell City to believe that they can play college football. And so uh, once, you know, I've heard an old coach one time, he's in the Hall of Fame. Matter of fact, he, don't, he didn't coach too far down the road from here. One of my big counterparts say one time, he's an older, older guy now, he's retired, and one of my nemesis, I nearly called his name, <laughs> said that uh, it's not my job to get him a scholarship. Uh, that's the coach's job. I beg to differ there. Uh, it is your job to get them a scholarship. That's that's part of it. I believe if you take care of kids, you'll, the winning will come. And I think it's our job as coaches to promote our players and push them and push them and push them. And, you know, I've gone over, hey, look, man, this is what a college degree does for you. This is what a college degree, a lack of one can do for you. So we push those kids, and I've had several kids this week say, Coach, you really think I can play college football? Absolutely you can. If you start for Pell City High School, uh, you, there should be a place somewhere for you if you're starting. Now, that may be Waldorf University in northern Iowa, or it may be McPherson, Kansas. It may be um, Cumberland, Tennessee. But there's enough schools out there that, there's enough if these kids want to go play and get their education paid for they can do that and if they start for Pell City and that's my hope is if we'll invest in these kids here in this community and say look man football can deliver for you and guess what it will pay a lot of of the tuition and the full scholarship and man football takes care of everything you know and I think uh, you know that's what we want. And I think if we do that and we keep pushing that deal, then the winning will come. And mothers will be excited. And, man, my son, you know, I can't afford for my son to go to school. Well, yeah, you can. If he's playing football, you can. If he's good enough to play and start for us, he's good enough to play college football. Coach, as we wrap up here on this uh, Tuesday evening here at City Market Grill and Buffet, uh, again, Friday, home game against uh, Leeds. It's going to be uh, – should be another great battle, uh, not only on the field but between you and Coach Hood, uh, two really, really good coaches on each sideline there. Uh, just one more opportunity to cur- encourage the, the community to come out and, and see the Panthers at Pete Rich Stadium at home, the new turf, um, everything that's being done and, and, and supporting the kids. Well, I think what I would like to see is that it's sort of like starting over. I told our players, you know, home game, your home opener is like starting the season over. And, you know, we knocked on that door last week. And the number one thing I wrote on the board this week, I always do the keys to the week and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's uh, it's time to explode. It's time to take that step, you know. And I think it's time to to, to, to go in and, and find a way you – to win and think about how you're going to win and put yourself in that right framework to win and you know I, I'm, I'm sort of like coach down the road I, I, I try to tell our kids to not not let the scoreboard dictate your play don't let the result of the scoreboard during the game affect how you play and that is so hard to get your kids to understand that is to quit looking at the scoreboard and play the game Play the game, do your job, play the game, do your job. That's and, and, and when that plays over and you've done your job, play the next play. Play the next play. Do not be result result oriented. Don't let external factors bother you. Don't let and, and what I mean by external factors is and it could be millions of different things. And that's the maturity of our club's got to get better. We've got to hone in on being focused on what we have to do to win games it's not about the music it's not about the hype it's not about anything but do your job that you've been coached to do prepare yourself mentally we're preparing yourself physically to get ready to win and then see yourself winning now our crowd can affect the game it can the one thing i'm gonna ask and 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 the people is 
we got to make sure we turn our music down when we're in the offensive huddle because we couldn't hear last night for nothing. So um, when and it's in between series and we got a timeout, I'm, I'm try to calm that down a little bit, when, especially when we're in the offensive huddle, talking and trying to get a play call in. But um, we'll get that worked out too. But I think I'm excited about our fans. I'm excited about the community. I just need everybody Friday night to be there. And it's a new beginning, a new beginning in our stadium, like you said, with new turf. And I think you'll see an effort. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to really push our team to explode and play well and play fast and play physical and, and then let the best team win. I mean, I, I'm excited about it. But, look, if we can get this one, if we could get this one, then I think we, there's a lot of good things can happen for this football team down the road. But, you know, it's not going to turn overnight now. I mean, um, we've got a tough stretch here with Leeds, Clay Chalk from center point. And uh, Clay's probably the week after one of the better top three teams coming in in the state in 6A and then center point will come in here 3-0. and So we we just got to continue to improve and focus on this one right now Friday night. Well, Coach, it's always enjoyable to sit down and talk some football with you. And, um, you know, we, we appreciate you coming out and looking forward to, uh, to the game on Friday. Thanks so much. Thank you all for having me. All right. Uh, that is going to wrap it up for the Coach Rush Pro Show here. Is again, broadcasting live every Tuesday. We do it. Come on out and join us. City Market Grill and Buffet starting at 7 o'clock. If you can't make it, we live stream it. Come on out. Pete Rich Stadium this Friday. Kickoff is at 7 o'clock. Get there early. It is going to be a packed house on both sides. So come on out and sports and Panther football here on the River Sports Network.